and we're going to keep working on our skills. So I had a list here of the uh, previously enjoyed tunes. And we were doing, we have Rosebud, High Road to Linton, More Ag of Dunvegan, Irish Washerwoman, Drowsy Maggie, Off to California. Have we got, did we work on that one recently? Don't think we did. So that'd be a really good one to work on. And it's, it'll be a new one for some people. Uh, Swallowtail Jig is the other one that I had on the list. And uh, so after practicing that stuff, I think it might be a good time to like learn a new tune because we've been very, very diligent working away at the material that we have. And everybody, I think, is getting stronger at it because we've, uh, we've been focusing so much on it. But I think it might be fun to learn something new uh, for the new season, you know, something to, something to obsess about all winter. And uh, it doesn't have to be a fast one. It could be a it could be a slow one. We only have a couple of slow ones on the on the list, so that might be nice. But so I thought tonight uh, we we could practice everything. I think it'd be great to just practice everything, everything on the list, uh, and then uh, and then next week we will learn a new tune, and I'll try to pick something that's going to use skills that we've been working on. Okay. So for now, let's get warmed up. We'll play, uh, let me see. So the first one on the list is Rosebud and then High Road. So why don't we do it by key? Why don't we warm up the key of A and we're going to play everything that we have that's in the key of A, okay? Then we'll do another key. We'll warm up that key and then we'll do everything that we have in that key. I think it might be G, okay? So that's how we'll proceed tonight. I'm going to mute everybody and we'll get started. I've been teaching teach pretty well all day, except in the afternoons, my fiddle should still be all right. Let me just check. All right, so A major is how we're starting off here, guys. A major scale and arpeggio is what we'll be doing. I'm going to give you your low A. That's the low A there. That's the G1. So let's all try a nice slow scale in the key of A. Are ready? Two, three, go. introduced this rosin to another fiddle player on the weekend. I was playing in North Bay with a band called Poor Angus, which is the only drumming gig that I do, was playing with Poor Angus. 
and uh, we do we play probably four or five times a year at this stage i really love it it's great fun the the thing i love about about it really the most is first of all it's my only drum gig so i'm not dragging the damn drums all over the city all the time which is really great and the other thing is is that with my other gigs you know i came down the stairs to go to the dress from the dressing room to go to the stage and I instantly did what I usually do, which is take a peek out at the audience and see who they are and who I'm going to be talking to and stuff like that. And then I realized that I'm behind the drums and I don't care. So I went and I just hid behind my drums and I did my thing. And it was so nice once in a while to be behind people. You know what I mean? But uh, the fiddle player forgot his rosin. And so he tried the baker's rosin and he sold. He's going to get on the list to get some. <laughs> Okay, anyway, let's do that again. Same thing except better. Here's your low A. Okay, ready, go. sharp on the D string just didn't press hard enough the a1 the B was flat didn't press hard enough again and then on the arpeggio I had the uh, C sharp on the a string flat and it's the easiest note of the world so I gotta do it again sorry you gotta do it again too a one two three go that time that were out for some reason I don't even know why and it bothers me because I got you know I have to be better more in tune than my brother Sean it's really important to me that I'm better than him at being in tune so we got to do it one more time same speed now how are you guys getting along are you doing pretty good 
Better than me, I hope. Astrid, what's wrong with the key of A? Tell me what tell me what you hate about it the most. Here you gotta unmute. Um, C sharps <laughs> and D's. I somehow uh, they're they're just not nice to me today. Um, C sharps with a D on the A string. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know why? Maybe. Well, let's do this. Let's do this. Everybody, play your C sharp. I could use it too. Here it is. <laughs> of that note it has a particular quality to it now I'm, I'm going to play the c sharp for you so that it's really bang on in tune then i'm going to play it a little flat so that you can hear what that sounds like so here it is in tune i find that it's a c with a little point on it and now here it is a little bit flat notice how the point is gone eh? it's gone the point is now gone so here it is in tune again. Oh, that's nice and shiny, right? Now, here it is sharp. You see how that has an edge? It's got too much of a point. See, that's how you can tell that it's sharp. And here it is in tune again to, to cleanse your palate. Okay, let's try our C sharp one more time. Ready, go. C sharp, eh? There it is. There's the D. Nice thing about the D is that you have the string below to test it against. Because octaves are easy to hear. Okay, so now that we've done that careful practice on those key notes that were bothering Astrid there, let's give it another try and see if that helps. I bet you it will. Okay. Ready, go! Did we do Rosebud last time? Yeah. So let's do Rosebud. Let's start off with that one, and then we're going to do High Road. Then we're, well, actually, let's do Rosebud and Morag. Then we'll get on to the reels, which is the High Road and uh, Mrs. McLeod's reel. So we'll start with the nice Rosebud. Rosebud of Allendale. Let me get it up on my screen so I don't improvise. We had a nice session on Tuesday night there. There wasn't, it wasn't as raucous as the previous Tuesday night when there was uh, 16 musicians. There was only 10 musicians this time around. So it's a little bit, a uh, little bit, a little bit less raucous, but very, it was nice because the bar was not busy. And so it meant that we could really play with each other and hear each other. And, we, and that was great. And me and the boys actually ended up putting together two sets of tunes that we are definitely going to put on the record that we made with Jennifer's Brass Quintet. Because we looked at it and we realized we thought we had two sets of our own on there, but we don't. We only have bits and pieces. 
So we, we've decided what we're going to do, and now we can just go in and do it. And we know what we're going to do because we played the sets, and everybody that was in the bar chatting politely with each other went nuts when we were done. So we know that it must kind of get across somehow. We, we do a lot of stuff like that. Okay, Rosebud of Allenvale. Little J. Scott Skinner to start off our evening here. Now, I'm not sure what how fast we had started going, but... I think we'll try it at that speed and see if anybody has problems, okay? Oh, one, two, three, one, two.
I realized the second phrase of that sounds like uh, fish, uh, uh, I'll lay me down in Fiddler's Green. See that? Wow, it just occurred to me. I've been playing this tune for probably, I don't know, 40 years, and that just occurred to me. There you go. They do say there's only 12 notes. You're bound to steal the odd phrase or two here and there, you know. Okay, so how's everybody feeling about the rosebud? They, all the bows were moving along just fine. The fingers that I could see looked like they were doing the right things. Is anybody having any problems with any bits of rosebud of Allen Vale? No? The I have a little is, question. Yeah. Um, I have the music that I have. Um, there's a section that we play twice, a little uh, like E E three E one switch over, but I think you're playing something else, not the E three. Is there an alternative note there? It's the it's the. Um... Sorry. <laughs> it's that one. It's in the third bar, or sorry, yeah, the third line, and then the last line is E1, E3, E1. E1. Uh, like that? Yeah. Oh, I just keep playing that, yeah. Uh, which is, I think, like, uh, I think that, that that it should actually be an A. You, know, you always have to be careful with these versions on the internet, eh? The G is fine, so I'll tell you, I'll show you the difference. That's what's there now is a G. Mm. Okay, the G is fine, but I'd say the A is probably more common, what you would run into more commonly, okay? Okay, so that's the, I don't know my letters very well. So, okay, so the G is what's there already. So that's the space on the top of the staff. Yeah. But you want, what you want is the next note up, which is an A. And then so, what do you play so, after the A? An, an, an F, just like it's there. So it's just the one note there that would be different if you're- Okay. Reading. But the G works fine too. Like if you're reading the G, you could just go ahead and play that too. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. Good question. It can be confusing. Anybody else have a question like that or a problem that I can help work work out? Dan, with a long bow, a, the pressure's gone. Oh, okay. So you don't? You mean you don't need to put pressure on it? it it's too light almost like I'm hardly getting any sound out of it. Okay, what you do about that, and especially it's it's very susceptible near the end of the bow where it's very, very light. Because the, you know, the, th the bow has what they used to call three parts. They got the heavy part, the, the really hard part to play in, which is the bottom part, the bounciest part, which is the middle, that's the bottom of the trampoline there. So it's, the, it's where it really wants to bounce on you. And you got the upper third, which they call the light part, because there's nothing up there. Just this tiny little stick. See that? So it's really, really light. So you have to bring in what they call weight. See that? And, and they don't, they, my dad's teacher used to say, I hate when people say pressure, because we never press on the bow. We always add weight with motion. See that? Weight with motion, and that's how that's how you keep the bow into the strings even at the light. Okay, now Stephen, that's pretty good, but your bow, you got to about here, and your bow started to go like this. Yeah. So you got to go. Whoa! See that? When when I bow, when I'm finished my down bow, my arm is out in front of me, and my wrist is as far back as it can go. So not like this, but like this. Okay. Much better. Much, much better. Now, the other thing I was going to say is that I love the way that my dad's teacher used to talk about 
how you put weight on the bow. Because he used to say that the bow is shaped like this, right? And that you play like that. You put the weight on like that as you do the down bow. And as you do the up bow, you take the weight off. Mm. Okay? Picking up on the bow. Bow shaped bowing. That's what he used to call it. And I really love that idea. Because that seems to do the job for most people. Just that simple motion there of keeping the keeping the bow into the strings. Okay, that was a really good question there, Heather. Really, really good. People are playing around with it now and trying to get a good sound down at the end of the bow. So that's really, really good. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? No? Let's do it again. Let's try the stuff we just talked about and see if we can do it this thing again. Oh, yeah, that's good. You're getting a good sound there, Stephen. Okay, here we go. More J. Scott Skinner. Oh, one, two, three, one, two.
Everybody's looking great. Is it doing, are you doing better with it? That's great. Very good. J. Scott Skinner, gotta love him. My dad used to tell stories about him that he had heard from other people about J. Scott Skinner. Because apparently they called him the Strasbay King. And they also called him the Kilted Fiddler because he always played in a kilt. And uh, apparently there's a story that he was playing at an at a aristocratic kind of party where it's a bunch of rich people and they weren't paying attention to him or the music and he didn't take kindly to that at all. He was just kind of being the wallpaper and he didn't like to, apparently he really did not like to play without getting the full attention of the crowd, you know, like having them all kind of wrapped. And uh, so they weren't paying attention. So he stood on his head and played the fiddle, even though he was wearing a kilt. Apparently that got their attention really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> apparently he had all kinds of tricks like that because it was in those days the trick fiddler was a huge thing everybody was kind of doing these he would play standing on his head he also apparently and i don't know if this is true but apparently he had a little a special bow that had a little razor blade down at the end of it okay and he would do this thing where he's playing a tune and he and he you know accidentally pops a string is usually the E string would be first, apparently, you know, and, and then he would go on and then he would clip the D string too. And then he would clip, and now he's only got the A string, but he's still playing the tune and he's jumping all over it like this to play to, to end up being able to play the tune. And that was one of his, one of his party tricks, apparently. Sounds pretty awesome. I'd love to see that. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time about Ashley McIsaac. They were like, you know, does he pre-break his bow hairs just for effect? You know? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> he just grinds away at the damn fiddle, my God. Okay, high road to Linton and, uh, oh no, let's do more egg since we're in the slow mood. More egg of Dunvegan. Uh, Jennifer's Aunt Kathy here in Toronto has a beautiful old fiddle that her daughter played back when her daughter was playing the fiddle, but she doesn't play anymore, would play the violin. And it's a 1953 Roth. Actually, if any, if you know anybody that's looking for a nice violin, this is a really beautiful violin. 1953 Roth. Roth was a German fiddle maker uh, from like the, uh, the late 1800s, uh, right up until like the sixties. Well, he ended up with a big factory and they were excellent fiddles, especially the ones during that they were built right during the war because, uh, the people's families did them at home after supper, they would make the backs, just the backs of fiddles or the fronts or the neck. And so after supper, they'd clear away the dishes and, and everybody would get their tools out and work on these the parts of the fiddles and then Mr. Roth would come around and pick up all the parts and use the best parts and make these fiddles and they were gorgeous absolutely beautiful fiddles and this one is doesn't have a mark on it it's a flawless 1953 Roth like beautiful violin they I think they want about six grand for it or seven grand for it something like that and uh I was down at Heinel and I gave it to, to the guys at Heinel because they she was trying to sell it and it's really hard when they know everybody. So I took it down there and I said, maybe I should call Ashley McIsaac. He loves Roths because he's got actually three Roths. And uh Andreas at Heinel said, No, don't call Ashley. He eats fiddles. <laughs> okay, more egg of Dunbay. This is a great tune, my God. One of my earliest memory tunes, Morag of Dunvegan. It's a hot chick's name, Morag. Okay, let's do it. I'll give you a big count in. We're in three here, so it's going to be one, two, three, go, two, three. Ready? And.
Now, how are we doing with Bold Morag? How's she feeling? Not bad? It's a very easy tune. Any problems or, or insights or anything like that anybody wants to share? Um, I just wanted to know the, the, uh, the rhythm. Are you counting like one, two, three, or you're just going like one, one? one it has a feel for an accent on the first beat of every bar absolutely it does so we're in three four time which is waltz time it's a little different than uh rosebud i think rosebud is written out in uh, uh six eight time so it's still groups of three but it's a different a different feel altogether let me see what it was that's right, six eight time. Yeah, so it's a different feel. So instead of having the accent at the beginning of every measure, it's kind of at the begin. It sounds like at the beginning of every other measure. Whereas this is a waltz, a straight up waltz. Now okay. there are, I find in my experience, three ways that people feel waltzes. They either feel the big accent at the beginning, like you were talking about there, Astrid. See that? That works. For most people, that's the way they feel it. And I, I'm talking about when they're actually waltzing. That's how I hear them feel in the music. See that? And then there's the uh, there's the one at the on the third beat. So it's kind of like this. So. feels great it's the it's the kind of the up before the down eh? and it gets people moving a lot but not everybody not as much as the first way that i described and then there's the viennese waltz like the blue danube or whatever and that's where the beat is in the middle okay and that's very kind of particular but in my experience most people feel a waltz with the with the emphasis on the very first note of the measure so that's what I'm doing there. So if I were to count it, it would be one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Good. So yeah, so that's a waltz. Any other questions or problems about Morag besides the name? No? Let's give her one more go then. You can work on your waltz timing. And then I'm gonna tell Sylvie she has to take a bath. All right. One, two, oh, we'll just uh, mute you there, Astrid. Don't worry. Keep your position oh. there. Don't move. Keep your position. I got you. I got you. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, go, two, three.
looking good, everybody. Keep work on it, working on it with intonation in mind and a nice sound. Eh? That should, that's the main focus for a tune like that because it's not speed. Speaking of speed, let's get out the reels. High Road to Linton and Mrs. McLeod's. I think we should do them together. I don't know if we've done that. The High Road to Linton. And Mrs. McLeod's reel. Okay, here we go. Both on the same page. I can't see Andy's book. That's handy. All right. So I think we should do the high road to Linton first. That's kind of the most commonly done thing. And we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get the common stuff here. So second one, Mrs. McLeod's reel. Did I ever send that to you? I don't think I have it. Oh, no. Okay, let me send it out here now. Take a look at. It. It's a very, very good tune to have under your belt. Everybody plays Miss Miss uh, McLeod's reel. Okay, so we got we got Stephen, we got Astrid. Okay. Is there anybody else that needs Mrs. McLeod's reel that does not have Mrs. McLeod's reel? No? Okay, so I'll just send it to, send it to you guys here. Okay, one second. Miss McLeod's. Okay, and attach it. Okay, and off it goes. Okay, you should have that now, guys. But we're gonna work on High Road to Linton first, okay? It's a hard one, it's gonna take, it's, you know, we've been working on it steady. So to get it up to a speed, it's gonna be, uh, lots of practice to get it working smooth because that second part is the uh, all that string crossing, eh? So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to practice high road to Linton nice and slow. We're going to do it a good few times, three times. We're going to try to get a little faster every time. So while you get yourself set up, I'm just going to tell Sylvie she has to take a bat. Wish me luck. Hey, Sylvia. You have to come and take a bath now, okay? You can take the podcast to your book or whatever. I'm going to do the podcast. Okay, don't drop the podcast into the bath. Oh. And you know how to run a bath, you're good? Let me get to the podcast in the pool. Okay, well you tell me when it's running and then I'll help you, okay? Can you just start? Okay. Yes. we go. High road to Linton. Now I'm wondering about a speed. I'm going to propose one. You think that'll work? Why don't we start there and see how we get along, okay? Let's do it at that speed twice. And then I want to check, uh, 
address anything that might come along that's bothering him. anybody. Here we go. One, two, three, go. really good really really good everybody i could see there's three or four people whose fingers i could see and it seemed like it was going great even that hard second part seemed to be going just fine how does everybody feel anybody having any problems it went unexpectedly good except for i'm having a problem with the g note the f and g on the second line I seem to have a problem. You know, G sharp is not a problem. 
C sharp is not a problem, but when I have to play the F sharp and G, putting the two fingers together, I yeah. put my hand in and, you know, I shape my hand oddly and it's yeah. just my thumb. Okay, remember this about that is that the first finger is where it normally goes. Okay, so that should feel totally normal. And then it's just to move the second down. See that? That's all it is. It should come down to meet the first finger. Now, I should also say that uh, back in the Royal Conservatory days, when they talked about the low two, which is what we're talking about here, the G natural as opposed to the G sharp, so the low two, there's three options for the low two, and you have to try to notice which one you are. So some people, when they're getting that G, G natural in tune, the two fingers are touching, okay? When it's, and that means the F is in tune and the G is in tune. With other people, the, the, those two fingers are occasionally touching. That's what they used to say, occasionally touching. So you're kind of, you know, as you're moving them, you're kind of feeling a little bit of each finger there. And then the other one is a gag, okay? Because some people have very narrow, slender ends of their fingers. And so when they put the two down in the low position, there still remains a gap. Okay, so you have to figure out like Lena, for instance, I bet you any money, you would have a gap, like when you put those two fingers down, because you got looks like you have small hands. You see what I mean? So you have to try to get to know which one you are. Now, Jerry Holland had huge sausage fingers. And he used to say that to get the when he was putting his third finger down, he'd have to get the second finger out of the way. Because <laughs> his third finger was so big. These are the things you have to notice about yourself to take some of the guesswork out, okay? So I'm going to play my G natural and I'm going to tell you what I am. Yeah, my tuner's happy and I can tell you that I am occasionally touching. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the gap there. See that? And my F is in tune and my G is in tune and I got tiny little gap but not not always so occasionally touching so you guys go ahead and find that g and tell me what you are okay so play the g play the f sharp and see what you have to be so how about you Stephen? what's it what's it looking like for you So what do you got there? Is that occasionally touching or are they touching for sure? Okay, right on. Who else wants to tell me what they've discovered? How about you, Elaine? How, what are you at there? Are you touching, occasionally touching or a cat? Occasionally. Occasionally. Now that is most people, I will tell you. Most people are occasionally touching. How about, uh, you, you look like you got it set up there. What are you? You're a guitar or a ukulele. You are a ukulele. a ukulele. Yeah, I hit the wrong button there. Uh, yeah, I'm occasionally touching. Just, okay. uh, yeah. And so you have to learn, like, it's which part of the finger touches. And if I feel it, then really? I know that, that the other the parts are, like, separate and it's okay. Yeah, see, that's good. And those are the little cues you look for so that you can feel comfy. Because nobody can tune every note. You have to do it by feel. You know what I mean? Now, how about you, Astrid? What are you discovering there? What are you? Occasionally touching, but probably more um, um, not touching. I, I think my fingers are so narrow or so thin. Um, I guess my mother didn't feed me enough when I was little. But, <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, I think they're they're kind of separated. So I'm going to have to do some guesswork. Well, yeah. actually, if you do have a gap, it's a small gap, eh? And actually, some people find the gap is easier to maintain than the occasionally touching, because at least you know if you're touching is too close. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Help. Help. Anything, you gotta grab onto anything. How about you, Heather? Did you figure out what you are? Just occasional. Occasional, okay, that's mm -hmm. good, that's most people. 
Uh, what about you, Bill? Did you figure out what you are to be in tune? I don't think he heard me. We'll leave him. How about you, Lena? What are you? Is this finger one and two or two and three? One and two. They are usually not touching. There you go. I knew it. See, there you go. Okay. So that's great. So you hold on to these things. And every time you go to play that G natural, you make sure that that is there, whatever you happen to be, and that the feel is there. And then it takes the guesswork out. Okay. That was a good point, Stephen. I'm glad we talked about that because that's a really, really, it's a very common thing to consider when you're starting off. And then can I ask you a related question? Oh, yeah. What happens when you move from, say, playing G sharp and then moving to G? I just want to see what happens to your thumb. Does your oh. thumb move? For me, I don't think anything. <laughs> Nothing happens to my thumb. Okay, no additional pressure. No, no. I don't think, I'll just check to a little bit more. So. No, I'm not having any change to my thumb for the two. That's a, it's a good question, uh, Stephen, but I don't think I'm having any variation. And it, it might be the type of thing where you're just kind of doing too much, you know, doing too much work with the hand to get these notes in tune when all you might need is just a little bit of a finger move. Okay. You always have to try to make this stuff into as little work as possible. We're musicians. I haven't had a job in like 15 years. As lazy as possible, as little work as possible. Let's try her again. Okay, so let's try it at this speed now. It's a little hustle, okay? One, two, three, go!
clip. My God. Jeez. Like me getting a speeding ticket. How do we do? Is it okay? Oh, that's good. Okay, keep working on it, guys. We'll get it faster. All right. Now, I sent out, uh, uh, what do you call it there? Mr. McLeod's reel. And uh, I think Astrid and Steven, it might be brand new to them. Okay. I'm going to play it just to remind you how it goes there. Top of the charts since 1740. It's pretty happening stuff. Okay, shall we do it? We're gonna go slow. We're gonna go nice and slow and uh, see if we can pick our way through it for these new people. And for the people that have done it before, we're gonna try to play it really, really in tune and with nice long bows to get the most out of it. So it's gonna be like this. That's how fast we're going to try it. One, two, three, go!
that's real. Now, how did that go, people? Steven, what do you think? You think you're gonna be able to play it? Yeah. Yeah, it's not that hard. I think you'll get it, no problem. Yeah. How about you, Astrid, how did you do? Well, my sight reading was okay. And then I started to think about all the rhythms that were all going. And then my tone, tune, my tone, my tune. Anyways, it was it went out the window when I was concentrating on the notes <laughs> and the rhythm. So uh -huh. once I knew one thing had to go, and that was what went. <laughs> so my fingers, they're really stiff. So anyways. Oh yeah. Okay. Kind of rough going, okay? <laughs> Yeah, no, I get it. It's a brand new one. So I figured that might happen. Now, a note about the rhythms that you're seeing there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this, this tune comes out of the Sky Collection, which is an ancient old book of uh, tunes uh, from the Isle of Skye, right? And uh, in those days, they, they wrote out a lot of reels uh, as if they might be played like a Strass Bay. And that's why you see these rhythms in here. So you can basically ignore them because they're just back in those days that people would play, excuse me, just for a change, people would play it like a fast pace. It's kind of neat, <laughs> uh, but uh, we were playing the reel. You know, most people play it as a reel. So that you can just kind of disregard those rhythms. Just play straight eighth notes through the whole thing. Okay, very good. Okay, I can do that. I think that might make it easier. And uh, how about everybody else? How are you doing with all this McLeod? Been a while, I know. Yeah. Now let's try it up a little bit, okay? For the new people, just keep your helmets on, keep shooting at the Germans or duck, you know, whatever. But for the rest of us, we're gonna try it a little bit quicker and see what happens. So kind of like. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. One, two, three, and.
did everybody do at the tempo? Steven gave up. He dropped his guns. Got overrun by the enemy. How about everybody else? Not bad? Oh, that's great. Right on. So don't worry, new people. You'll get it. You'll get a chance to get it. Now, if you're having a big problem with the uh, sight reading, I think I have a version that has the fingering in it. Did I send you a version that has fingering written in, little numbers? Okay, there you go. So that, that'll help with your sight reading a lot, okay? That's the Suzuki method of, of, fing, of numbering your fingers. And it's a great idea. Uh, so that's one, two, three, and four. See that? And we don't use four very much. So one, two, and three. So that's when you see A1 there, that's the first finger on the A string, okay? A2 is the second finger on the A string. A3 is the third finger on the A string, okay? And it's a really good way to get you started reading. And, and what they do in the Suzuki method is that they gradually start to take out the numbers. And so what they do first is, if there's two of the same note, they'll only label the first one of the two notes. See that? After a while, they'll take out the first finger, uh, uh, you know, uh, numbers throughout the whole thing. And after a while, they'll take out the second so that the only one left is the third, because that's kind of the hardest gap. And then you're off the numbers, then you don't need the numbers anymore. But I did numbers. I, I find it a really good way to learn how to read because it's a quick, easy way to read. You just got to make sure all the time that you know what note you're playing. Okay, that's all. All right, let's switch keys. That's enough of this Scottish key of A. Let's switch to G. And we'll do some Irish. Whew. The old Irish. That was part of one of the questions uh, that Irish Music Magazine asked uh, us was, uh, was about me and how come so much Irish. And uh, I had to explain that when I moved to Toronto, like my, Toronto is uh, a very Irish city. There's a lot of Irish expats here. I know a lot of them. And uh, it's been that way for a long, long time. And so if you're playing jigs and reels in Toronto, you're most likely playing Irish. The Scottish part is actually quite small unless you play the Highland Pipes. If you play the Highland Pipes in Ontario, you're, there's, there's more pipers in Ontario than there is in Scotland. And for the longest time, the world champion pipe band, like for like a decade, was the Peel Police Band here in Ontario. They won the worlds every year for ages. Eh? So it's a very strong tradition of piping in Ontario and a very high level of piping. But it's not for fun. It's not music for fun, which is a very interesting thing. I mean, I know they have fun when they perform it, but they don't sit around and play tunes. It's just not a thing, see? So when I came to the city and I was looking for, uh, for you know, some Scottish music, I went to Sandy McIntyre's thing, but that's not really a session. That's that, that was just him playing, and he would invite me up to play a few sets on my own, but it wasn't a session where people would get around and play tunes. So that was it. So I was going to the Irish sessions. That was the only one, and there was one every night of the week. Monday night was my friend Pat Simmons. Tuesday night was Ina O'Brien from Galway, her session. Wednesday was the Transact, which is a great one, and I encourage you guys to go. It's for beginners. They post the music that they're going to practice on a website ahead of time. They go slow. It's a really nice group of people. I have four or five students that go to that session at the Transac on a Wednesday. It's uh, every second Wednesday of the month or something like that down at the Transac. Thursday was Dora Keogh with Pat Simmons. Friday was the Kaylee. Saturday was Dora Keogh again, and so was Sunday. And then we did it all again, and I went to every one because I was trying to learn music, okay? Uh, and so, yeah, so it's, that's, that's how the Irish thing happened here in the city, because it's basically like, that's all there is. But luckily, I really love it. It didn't take long before I got really into it. And so now I try to lean both ways, depending on who I'm with and who I'm in front of. Okay, key of G, we're going to do uh, uh, Irish Washerwoman and the Swallowtail Jig. That's what we're going to do. I want to play them together as a set. But first, let's run up and down a G major scale first to make sure it's all working good. Okay, 
G major. Let's go not too fast and tune our notes. A one, two, ready, slow. G? Is it all there? Let's speed her up then. Let's do it faster. I'm going to open this window and it's getting stuffy in here. It's a hard time of year. Okay, that's better. Okay, a little faster. One, two, three, go! slightly out that I had to tune. Otherwise, I did really good. How did you guys do? Pretty good? Not bad? Let's do it again right away then. Make it feel and sound the same. One, two, three, go. Swallowtail and T the Irish Washerwoman. I think we were doing the Irish Washerwoman first. All right, so let's do them two times each. Okay, get them up on my screen here. Washer. Great. And the Swallowtail. All righty, let's do it. Two times each. Now I'm thinking about a tempo because we practice these a little bit. That should work, eh? Let's do it. One. Two, three, go!
right. Jeez, everybody was happily going there. Now the Swallowtail is a brand new one for you, Astrid. Okay, that's fine. You were getting it on the second time around, eh? A little bit. <laughs> It'll take time, you know, because it's brand new or whatever. How about you, Stephen? How'd you do with these ones? Fairly new for you too. No problem, but I think I just need to practice. Just pray, just enough, nothing a few hundred times won't solve, eh? Okay, that's good. How about everybody else? Any problems that are going to get in the way of going a bit faster? Okay, let's do it. So Stephen and Astrid are just going to have to keep the helmets on and the rest of us are going to try to go faster, okay? So let's try it like this. Okay, that's a nice clip. It's like, it's an in-betweener. It's gonna have a little drink of water. And let's do it. Give you a good counting. One, two, three, go!
was a clip. That was faster, I think, than we've tried to do those tunes yet. How did everybody feel at the end of that? Besides exhausted. <laughs> Is it working okay? I am um, on the swallowtail because I haven't really looked at that. I decided to play the first note of every triple note. So I play on the first bar, I play the G and hold it for three counts. And then I play the B and then hold it for three counts. You know? <laughs> and I was work. trying to keep in tune, you know? So yeah. it sounded like, um, I don't know, EGB. I think I was doing okay on the E minors chord there anyway. But the That's other great. parts were sounding okay too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. No, that's a really good way to do it. No, that's very encouraging. So for you new newbies, we're going to practice these, uh, the swallowtail and the Miss McClouds. That's going to be your big kind of mission in life. Okay. Field, field, Marshall Montgomery keeps, what's this here? What are you saying, Lena? These kids with their texts. Oh, sandwiches. sorry. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're talking about the worlds and I was just thinking... <laughs> That Phil oh. Marshall Montgomery keeps winning the worlds. They're Irish, which is very annoying. We were talking about the Irish Scottish dynamic there. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, that <laughs> happens, right? Yes, the Irish coming in. <laughs> it's funny that they're named after Field Mon Marshall Montgomery. He was an Englishman. He, he was the guy that, uh, do you know who that was? That was the, he was the guy that led the British Army in the invasion of, uh, of uh, German, Germany uh, in World War II, Monty. They call it even Monty. weirder. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's kind of kind of <laughs> wild. Eh? It's uh, very interesting. But uh, he's he was quite a guy. He, it was him and Patton that uh, that invaded uh, Europe. So anyway, there you go. Sorry for the side <laughs> note. I had to. <laughs> That's all right. I understand. Okay, so we got a good plan. So next week is going to be a new tune. I'm going to post it this week. I'm going to figure one out that it's going to be a challenge and bring us all forward, okay? And it's not gonna to be too complicated because the whole point is to get strong in the stuff that we're playing, but I do think it's time for a new one as well. So I'll figure that out and I'll record it and I'll find music for it. Cliffs and Moher is a great tune. You guys ever heard that tune, Cliffs and Moher? I'll play it quick here before we go. You can tell me if you like it and if you do, we'll learn it. popular tune. We play it in Cape Breton, they play it in Ireland. It, the, the Cliffs of Moher are in Ireland. They're a tourist attraction. I've been there. I didn't really see them because the fog was so thick you could hang and you could drive a nail and hang your coat. So I didn't really see them at all, but I'm sure they're beautiful. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we'll learn that one. That's a great one. Why not? And it's an, it's an A minor. So that's, that's something that's a little different. A minor. It's got the same key signature as C major, which is none, no sharps or flats. And I'm sure you heard some F naturals in there and some C naturals in there. So it'll take a tiny bit of getting used to, and it would be a very good way to move forward. I think the Cliffs and Moher, great suggestion there, Heather. Very, very good suggestion. Yeah. So I'll do that. And actually it's already on the YouTube channel because my intermediate class did. It was played slow and fast. So go ahead and, and check it out and I'll send you the music for it because I found a very good version as well. And Elaine, I'm going to check out now. I forgot to 
I, I forgot to try to get into the uh, uh, the Celtic Orchestra YouTube channel. So I'm going to try right now, and I'll email you. I went on just before we started. Yeah. And I got in this time. So I don't know what oh. was this afternoon. Oh, okay. Well, as long as it's possible, then that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I put the rehearsal up there right away, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Yes, Bill. Uh, is that is that the Cliffs of Morag? Of Moher. M O H E R. M O H E R. Thank you. M O H E R. Yeah, on the west coast of Ireland. It's a very, a very, uh, it's like in the middle of the island on the west coast. Beautiful. Almost song. like mother, right? Yeah, that's right. Almost like mother. It just needs a tea. <laughs> Okay, that's great, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thanks a million. Thank you. Good night, Good night now. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.